As always, our show is sponsored by Memoria Press. You can find our curriculum at memoriapress.com. Welcome to Classical Etc., a show from Memoria Press that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Welcome to another episode of Classical Etc. Proceed with Martin, Tanya, and Paul. And today's topic is on writing well. Just kidding. That's a book by William Sinzer, worth reading. But <laughs> oh, I thought we're you were not going to be discussing that book. We're going to be talking about how to write. But before we get there, Martin, have you been reading anything interesting of late? I just finished the second volume of the Story of Civilization series by Will Durant, mm. um, The Life of Greece. And just I just remind I was reminded once again what a great writer and historian and you know a number of things he was. You have to you have to you have to know how to do a lot of things in order to write the story of civilization, right? Um and I just I, I what I wanted to do is I wanted us to go ahead and start into the third series. And I think, well, if if I keep that up, I won't be reading anything, you know, much of anything else for the rest of my life because I'll be <laughs> in the story of civilization series, which is eleven volumes. Yes. Uh, but gosh, what a what a what a great um, what a great writer to put yourself in the hands mm-hmm. of to give you all this history and the, the story of philosophy, the story of literature, it, everything's in there. Says, is it, is it still in print? Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's, as it, it should be. Yes. As it but should you be. never know. Right. Um, so I've just, it, I've just been enjoying th- that immensely. Uh, I, I read the first one a couple years ago, read, read this one now. So I got, I'm going to have to pace myself. I'm going to have to put a few shorter books in between uh, this one and the next one. So I, I haven't decided what I'm going to read Next, just finished another Louis L'Amour novel, uh, The Skyliner. Has just been enjoying the Sackett series, um, which is which could could do a, a, as a history of America of the American frontier. Mm. Uh, so, so tell for people who have not read the History of Civilization books, tell us how they're written. What what would you expect? Because I could imagine going into those books and them being too densely factual, or how is he choosing the narratives that he's picking up on? What could you kind of give a taste of well, how he uh, constructs this, this story? Yeah. Well, and, and what he's having to do is he's having to skip around in time a little bit because he'll talk about a certain kind of thing, say philosophy or something, and he'll be going through the whole history of Greece just on that one talk. But then, and then you're back at the beginning again on something mm-hmm. else, uh, politics or whatever it is. Uh, so, it, you know, it's not a, it's not a chronological thing. Mm-hmm. So his, his explanation of the philosophers of Greece, I, I was a philosophy major. I've been reading philosophy for many years and I learned so much uh, about figures that I had not really focused on. Um, and what a great civilization this was. And, and his point at the end, we're all Greeks in so many ways, intellectually, the, the, our inquisitiveness, our, this, this is a product of the Greeks and his, his explanation of how the Greeks, you know, Alexander takes over the whole known world and he was an ambassador of Greek culture and he brought it with him. And when we, you know, we hear about the Hellenistic world, it's, you know, Alexander goes out there, conquers it and brings his culture with, with him. And this is the West. This is the beginning of Western civilization. That was the Jewish problem, right? With the Maccabean revolt and, mm-hmm. you know, with, with Alexander bringing Greek culture into Israel. Well, and I, yeah, yeah. one of, one of, you know, one of, and his, of course, when Alexander dies, that, you know, the, the, the empire only lasts as long <laughs> right, as Alexander. Right. And when he right. dies, his, his what, four or five generals, he gets split up between them. Right. But each one of them has their own little thing going on. And, you know, the, the Ptolemies in Egypt and the, the Seleucid kingdom. I never really knew what that was. That mm-hmm. was from one of Alexander's generals. Uh, Has anybody ever been able to do what Alexander the Great did? I don't mean conquer the whole world, but I mean really been that kind of a figure that could do by himself what several people couldn't maintain. Well, what's because at the end of the book, he talks about the, the onset of Rome. And with Rome, it's not one figure. It's this organized body mm-hmm. of soldiers that are all about order, and they go and they order the whole world. And it did the, the the story of them coming into Greece and asserting themselves. Very different kind of culture, 
that's the thing, you know, this, when we say Greco Roman, but those are two very diff- different, different. Well, and even the Roman government, right. It's a, it's a Republic. So even their, yes. their hierarchy is very ordered, but because of that, even the politicians for hundreds of years were recognizing that order Whereas Greeks, you know, they're just all fighting for the person, one person to be on top. Yeah. Well, when, when I give talks on this, I talk about, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Greeks values being strength and intelligence and the Romans, it was order and piety. And that, that is, it just underscored this for me, mm-hmm. you know, uh, piety being the order of the soul, even, you know, stoicism was very, a very prominent philosophy there because it was ordering yourself, ordering yourself towards what you perceive as the good. And, and um, it's just the contrast between the two civilizations. And so the next, I think the next volume is on Rome. So is it called Caesar and Christ? Pardon? Is it called Caesar and Christ? Uh, it, yes, I think it is. Cheryl gave me that book when I was teaching and I never really knew why. But, you know, she would every now and then just hand me a book like this could help you because I was teaching the Middle Ages. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it's on my bookshelf. I've never read it. Well, I, I have you a, make me interested yeah, in a, it. A, a friend of mine who who I who I will not whose name I will not mention, he is got it Bryce? Basic, no, it's okay. not Bryce. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> he um he went to college and basically he just he knew a professor and he asked the professor if he would teach him and somehow this was worked into a to where he could actually get a bona fide degree, but most of his education was reading the story of civilization. Mm. Mm-hmm. Wow. And he's a very intelligent person. I mm. think partly as a result of that. Wow. Well, the book I'm reading is not nearly, it sounds like it's dense, but a very good book. Um, so I'm reading Till We Have Faces. And so I'm mm-hmm. rereading ah. uh, the C.S. Lewis book. I read it the first time, <laughs> I think my freshman year of college. I've never read that. I need to reread that. I've read it once and I think, I think a lot of it went over my head. generally agree it's his best piece of fiction. Um, I've, what's interesting is my relationship to Lewis is that when I was younger, I, I've read more Lewis than any other author, even though there are certain authors I've been obsessed with. I've probably Have you read, read everything Lewis read? I, don't, I haven't, but I've read like 17 of his books if you count the Narnian books, but all of them when I was younger. So I haven't returned him as many. Um, so this is one that I'm returning to and I'm enjoying it. It's, it's set um, in the kingdom of Glome, but which is made up. And one of the characters is from the Greek lands, which is also kind of made up, but kind of not kind of based on Greece. And so it's an interesting twist of it. Um, the way he weaves in kind of the Greek influence and, and tries to capture the spirit of kind of that age of religion in, uh, in the novel. It's pretty, pretty That's interesting. Why I haven't read it, right? It's fantasy. It is fancy fantasy, but it's mythology. It's, it's kind of a blend of yeah. fantasy and mythology. Not that I'm anti-mythology. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing I do have to point out, though, that and I don't know if you guys feel this reservation, Martin, I'm looking at you, I'm interested in your thoughts, is I, I do feel like the older I get, when I return to Lewis, his kind of fronting of the symbolism is less and less appealing to me the older and older I get. Um, it's, it's very, very clear what he's doing, kind of speaking with the spiritual or theological message. Here comes a metaphor right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and so I think it's lost a little bit of its edge for me because of that. I, I hope I didn't ruin it for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. For your influence on my life. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's, that's why I think, I think your, your intellectual growth and, and I love C.S. Lewis and I, 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 I'm, I do favor his prose writing as opposed to his fiction, but Here I, Here you go again. What? Oh, essay. Is, Let's is, say is essay. Non-fiction? Because fiction is prose. Okay, fine. Um, so, uh, but I, I think that you, your intellectual, your literary growth isn't a Tolkien. I think Tolkien's a much more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. If you're um, contrasting. The imaginative two. writer. Yeah. There's a lot of growth into other authors as well. But if we're <laughs> sure. contrasting the two. Tanya, anything aside from Mansfield Park that you've been reading recently? Here's the thing. <laughs> I had to leave for work this morning with six pages to go. Oh my goodness. Oh, wow. I know. So now I can't wait to get home yeah. because I've got to finish it. But I was so close and I just couldn't put off. I was trying to finish it drying my hair and then my hair, <laughs> you know, it dried too fast. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I was going to be late if I waited any longer. That's very <laughs> so relatable. I've got six pages to go. 
But I will say that I am just a huge fan of it now. Yeah. Where I, so I'm glad that Lita made me re- revisit Fanny Price. Tony, I have a suggestion for you. Yes. So um, maybe our listeners will know one of my friends who works here, who's appeared on this podcast before, Mitchell Holly. Yes. He worked for a pastor for a short time who, when they would travel, would make Mitch read commentaries to him aloud. You know, oh, so that he could gosh. prepare for <laughs> upcoming sermons. Oh, goodness. And I wonder if maybe you should hire someone to ride to and from work oh, for you read to, to read to you. Yeah. You should consider it. Well, I, I can c- say that I've never read a book with a blow dryer in my hand. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, it takes a long time to dry my hair. And so that's a great opportunity for me to read a few pages. And this morning I was thinking, okay, because usually I'm like, this takes so long to dry my hair. But this morning I was thinking, take longer. <laughs> <laughs> if it was an audio book, you could have listened to it coming in and finished it. I could have, but that's not the way I want to do this. You know, I've got that beautiful Chiltern edition, mm. and which you can't write on. FYI. So I'm using like a colored pencil because the pages are glossy. It's mm. a beautiful book. And it's in it just you it's important, you know, the way you can hold a book. Like the actual feel of a book and it's perfect. Except the pages are so glossy it's really hard to write mm. on it. And and I hate to use a pen because they smear with me because I'm left-handed. Just, I could go on and Your on life sounds life. Yeah, it's I very know, <laughs> But I wouldn't. I life would, is hard. I want to read the last six pages in that book. Not yeah. is it, but it, I did think I could get, I've got loads of Audible credits I never use. I could certainly finish this last six pages and it wouldn't really cost me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I sympathize with you, Tanya. Yesterday I had, I think, two or three pages left. I was at home reading a book by myself and Sarah walked in the door and I had like two or three pages left and I was like, I need silence. I need to finish this. <laughs> Give me a minute. You know, sure. it's hard. To, it's hard to put it down. Well, when you're and right I did this with Pride and Prejudice. I I had the Audible so I could listen to it in my car, and I also had the book, so I just pick it so up. So then you could go back, and yeah, I could do that. Right. And I've done that with books mm-hmm. before. I've got an autobiography, autobiography, a biography of Elizabeth II that I'm mm. kind of going back and forth with. Mm. But for this, I just need I just sure. need to finish the experience holding the book. Yeah, it sounds like a g- good experience. Yes, because. As far as I know, at this point, Edmund and Fanny have not gotten together. <laughs> no spoiler alert. <laughs> um. Well, there's no spoiler because it hasn't happened. Yeah. Uh, Paul? So speaking of listening to books, uh, I recently started listening to um, The Bridge of San Luis Rey. Mm-hmm. I don't know how the I Thornton should Wilder? pronounce that in, in English. Who, who wrote uh, that? I think it's Thornton Wilder. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I haven't, I probably a third of the way into it. It's a very short novel. Um it's very interesting because it's it's sort of a foray into so this bridge collapses, a few people die, and then he kind of examines each one of their lives and is like why why would this have happened to them? Mm. Which is an interesting question. Mul- is it multiple perspectives? I think I tried. I to think read so. It I, I think so. I've only over. I'm only in the first person story, and I think mm-hmm. I've got two more to go. Um, and so that's interesting to me, but that's uh, exclusive. I don't have a paper version of that book, so it's exclusively. Yeah. The whole multiple perspectives thing. I, you know, it's so nice to have a straightforward narrative in a book. Mm -hmm. And, and so. Didn't the Lincoln highway have multiple perspectives? I feel like it did. Like we were. I think it did. Yeah. It did, but. (sighs) Which is, it is a little harder. Yeah. But I, uh, I'm blanking on the author's name now. Um, Amor Tolls. Amor, Amor Tolls. Uh, yeah, he 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 pulls that off somehow. I don't I don't know how. But and then um so that's the book I'm listening to. The book I have pulled off the shelf yesterday is a collection of Winterberry short stories, Fidelity. Um so and that's Yes. So on an upcoming you. episode of this podcast, we're gonna do another short story discussion on Fidelity uh by Wendell Berry. So it's going to be a good discussion. I'm excited. So everybody can read it ahead of time if you've got the time. Absolutely. So that um, you can participate with it. And us. it's, at least in the copy I have, it is a short story within a book called Fidelity. So it's a short story called Fidelity in the book called Fidelity. It's also in that distant land, which I gave Shane. And I thought it would be in that Library of America collection, but it's not. I Maybe I don't have the whole, both volume. Maybe that's two volumes and I only have one. I don't know. As Tanya knows, I I I use that volume, <clears throat> Fidelity, which has Fidel the short story, Fidelity as its first story, 
is the Wendell Berry starter kit mm. for people. Oh, uh, yes. It's a great because it's got five five really good short stories. It really gives you a taste of his writing, and and I think two of those are among his best. Uh, Did you Without used to have like six good. copies of that in your trunk? Because I think that's where I got my copy. He probably still does. I think you literally gave. Martin's trunk is yeah. just overflowing with books, <laughs> and as he drives, they just spill out of the back. It's Any the one of which could end up being my used Christmas present yes, just coming year. here. Could I'm be. really excited if about if which good. trunk selection I will get. <laughs> one thing that our get our listeners will experience if they take us up on this offer to read Fidelity is great writing because Wendell Berry is Look a great you segue. writer. Mm-hmm. And that segues to our topic for today, which is writing. You're so smooth. Thank you. <laughs> One question for all of you to get this conversation started. It is a goal at Memorial Press at Highlands Latin School. It's one of the essential goals of a great education to equip students to write well. And in an age of, you know, chat GPT and email writing and all of the things that, uh, that are shaping the way students take in the written word and then put it back out into the world. I have a question for you. That's too broad that we're going to have to unpack. What makes great writing? Mm-hmm. Martin, what makes great writing? I didn't know you were going to ask me that question. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that you can say, I, I, I think that, I think it's one of those things, you know, it when you see it, um, you can think of examples of it. You say that's great writing and that's great writing and that's great writing. And that's not. And that's not. But to there there are some things that you can't just give the elements of and give any adequate definition of something. And I think writing is one of those. So things. would that that would seem to be a good premise to then defend the statement that to learn to write well, you ought to do it by modeling. Well, I don't I Yes, well, I, I think so, I and that's think imitation has to be yeah. a part of it. That's the way I learned to write. I I, I had this. I've I, in my in my garage. I still have these three bound volumes about that thick, about about four inches thick, of <clears throat> the uh, uh, Daily Nexus newspaper that I was uh, editorials editor of at the University of California, Santa Barbara, in the early nineteen eighties, and so all my columns are in there. And I go, I go back and I read those and I'm thinking, oh, this is like a shameless imitation of, you know, whoever, William F. Buckley or Joseph Sobrin <laughs> or whatever. I mean, I'm reading, going, oh, it is, it's off-putting. It's such Cringe a shameless wording. imitation of, of, of some writer. And so that, that is how I learned how to write. I learned how to write by copying people. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're going to talk about how to, how, learning how <laughs> to write. Who's running this show? <laughs> but before we get there, nice segue. it was a great segue. <laughs> But what is great writing? Tanya, what do you think great writing is? Could you could you try to put a definition on it? I think I agree with Martin. I don't know how you put a definition on it. I think I honestly think that great writers have they've learned all of the mechanics. They've read a lot. So they imitation is I think definitely you've got to know great writing before you can ever be that. And you do need to know the mechanics. You do need to know how to frame a sentence. But I think after that, when you've got all of that, I think it's a gift. And that the people who are really great writers have been gifted mm-hmm. with something that everybody has doesn't have that gift no. for. Uh, uh, let me interrogate that just a little bit because I think in a way it's sort of like a sport. Okay, uh, my kids played soccer. Uh, if I had to say what what makes a good soccer player, I wouldn't say well, uh, dribbling the you know uh, uh, doing all these tricks that they do in practice with the ball, or any one of the other single uh, things that you do to prepare for soccer. They all prepare you for soccer, but you can't really say that that's an element. Of soccer, it's it's developing a skill that you will then use when you play in a game, but it's not the same thing. So I think I think the same is true with writing. Is there are exercises you can do? The pro gymnasmatas mm-hmm. is an mm-hmm. example of that. Those are exercises you're doing, but when you write, you're not necessarily 
doing that at least in the same way. It it it's it's somehow you got to get beyond the mechanics. You got to mm-hmm. get beyond the mechanics, but mm-hmm. there there is certainly inspiration, absolutely. And, but but and I do think that um, practice certainly helps, as Martin found out from his years at yeah. University of California. Um, <laughs> that you can practice and get to be a really good writer, but I think to be a great writer, I think it's a I think it's a gift. Yeah. I really do. I just think I could practice and practice and practice, and I would never be able to tool a sentence like Tolkien. <laughs> and you know, I don't even like fantasy, but I. But he's a great writer. Mm. And and when you open a book, and every sentence is beautiful, whether you like, you know, the orcs or not, then that that is. I th- I think it's a gift. It's kind of like music in that. You know, a lot of people would say, you know, with the guitar, for instance, to learn to play the guitar, you know, a lot of people just listen to the great musicians and they learn how to play the, the riffs and the songs exactly as those great musicians play them. And you can get good doing that. Right. But to actually be one of those musicians, you have to do your own thing afterwards. Mm-hmm. And only some people are gifted well enough to do that. Yeah. I heard uh, an interview with Eric Clapton and somebody asked him a question, how, how, what do you say to aspiring guitarists who want to play. He said, well, don't try to play like me. Try to play like the guys I tried to play like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that is very interesting advice. He's, in other words, and I've said this about Go like- back the, to the source. Yeah, because there's a lot of like homeschoolers who want, you know, they, the founding fathers. Or the, okay, that's fine. But if you really want your kids to grow up and have something like- uh, you know, uh, like the founding like fathers the found, had, then like the founding fathers had, then go and read the people the founding fathers read. Mm-hmm. Read Polybius, read Cicero, read Aristotle. Okay, um, so I I, th- I thought that was great advice because it's imitation, but in a slightly different sense. Paul, what about you? Do you think you can give us a definition? These these two just want to jump right to giving advice about writing. But I I'm going to skip the definition and talk about an element that I think that would be in it. Okay which is clarity in the argumentation. Mm. So whether it's fiction, whether it's essays, whether it's poetry, there's always some point being made. And I think uh, a good writer, a great writer, even if he, even if that, that writing in some ways is going to hide it because he wants you to draw that out. It's going to be a, it's going to be something you can take with you. And that's what a lot of students struggle with is, because they're trying to juggle so many things, the mechanics, the style, and oftentimes their argument is just uh, sorely lacking because it it is more conceptual. It's not something that you can, that's very tangible. And so any great writer is going to make that argument apparent without, you know, necessarily it being on his sleeve. The difference between C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, we say they're both great writers, but C.S. Lewis is making that very apparent. Tolkien's making it very apparent, but in a different way. But I still think that argument is is a is a key point that uh, I don't think a lot of classrooms focus on. Mm. They, they're they're focusing on the mechanics or they're focusing on the style. But you need to take that time to to talk about what actually are you saying. Could we nuance what you're saying by articulating it in this way? that great writing achieves its purpose that I think sometimes great writing is intentionally ambiguous or opaque, but the great authors achieve that rather than unintentionally slip into ambiguity Mm -hmm. or opaqueness. Yeah. I'd be good with that. Well, since you agree with me, (laughs) I want to be the first to ask you our next line of questioning, which is how can we teach students to be great writers? But before I ask you that, we're going to take a quick break. On your mark, get set, go live. Classical Etc. is hitting the road and going live at the Great Homeschool Convention in Cincinnati, Ohio this coming April. We'll be there with the rest of the Memoria Press team to meet with you, answer your questions, and come together at this table for a live taping of Classical Etc. Join us in Cincinnati April 13th through 15th at the Great Homeschool Convention. Follow the link in the description to learn more. Hope to see you there. So, Paul, a lot of what we're trying to do at Memorial Press and at Highlands Latin School and the Online Academy is teach students to be great writers, to help them to be great communicators. How do we actually do that? What is the best way to train up a student to write well? I would go back to the 
analogy we used before of athletic soccer practice, you know, like you don't always, you're not in, in practice. You're not always scrimmaging. You've, you've got to step out and practice those skills. And, and what I was just saying, there's so many things that they're trying to juggle when they actually sit down to do a real paper that when, when you're, uh, when you're teaching students how to write, I think you need to tell them this is the element we're focusing on. Let's hone that. Um, you know, let's, let's dribble the ball for 30 minutes and get good at that. And so then that way, when you're actually in that scrimmage or in that game, you're not having to think about it. And so I think we need to break down writing into specific skills. I think you need to think about mechanics. You need to think about style. You need to think about arrangement of your ideas and then, and, and build students up into that little by little. Tony, what about you? I'm going to do the practical thing again. Um, which I'm so well known. <laughs> I'm going, I mean, you first, you have to teach them how to write a sentence mm. uh, as very early on. And we work really hard to do that, to teach them what a sentence looks like. Right. First of all, just what is a sentence? But then very quickly, is this a good sentence? Can it have a, a more exciting verb? Or um, can we add an adjective? Or is it too long? Can we make it more concise? All of those things is where you've got to start. And then... After that, I think, and this is um, this is my soapbox moment, because I really think that we are messing up in education because we are not requiring students to rewrite enough. Mm -hmm. I think that if you do, you know, you've got even like our classical composition program. So we've assigned do do this do this lesson this week and then move on to this one and then move on to this one. But if you never take your student's last paraphrase and edit it and make them rewrite it until it's perfect, they're not going to learn how to write because when you hand it back to them with red all over it, they're going to put it in their backpack or they're going to put it in a drawer or they're going to throw it away. But if you don't ever make them see what it takes to fix it and mm. make them mm. fix it, then they're not going, I don't care what grade they are, you know, all the way up through high school, they need to edit. You're better off doing fewer exercises and doing the ones that you do until they're perfect. I think that's a great point. There's like a moment, a very vivid moment for me in a college advanced writing class that I, where I realized that nothing that comes out of my brain to the paper or word processor is good. Right. And, then, well, and I just had to learn that for me, I'm going to have to rewrite and rewrite two or three times before I ever get to a point where the thoughts start making sense. Which everybody does. All great writers. Well, I don't know about all great writers, but, you know, I've done a lot of work with Wendell Berry and the, you, the rewriting process. Mm -hmm. I had no idea when I started that what it was going to be. Jay Crow was the first book that I typed and I gave it to him. And he brought it back with a post-it note on every page. Mostly he was he he would add a sentence or he would take a, he took a bunch out. You know, he was just constantly making it more and more concise. So then I reprinted it, sent it back to him, and then there was just a post-it note on every other page. I mean, by the time he finishes with a book, he's been through it so many times mm. that every you know, we're all sick of it mm. because it's just been it's tedious to be, you know, to be a really good writer is there is a lot of work involved. I And he's my example. I don't know. Maybe not everybody does that, but I don't know how you could write anything and not then look at it the next day and think, oh, I need to fix mm. this. Well, what about is you? anybody that talented? Martin, are you a first draft guy? Actually, no, you know, you're not sitting, because Dana is so heavily at <laughs> your material. Uh, I, <clears throat> he knows I Dana's just, gonna fix whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, she's gonna she's gonna cut it all up. And uh, <clears throat> I, I was, think, was thinking when Tanya was talking, how I'm working on something right now, and it is just not coming. I, it's like giving birth, you know. Like I know a lot about that, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like I imagine giving birth would be like, um, and I, <clears throat> every sentence is just a chore and I can't, it, and so, it, and it's not like I, I don't know what I want. I, in this particular case, I, I'm, 
I'm, there, I'm, I'm trying to, there's several things I'm trying to say it, it, and I, I need to say them in the right order. Most of the, most, I mean, sometimes I will sit down and I will be finished in 15 minutes. I'll, I'll write a short essay and I'll be done in 15 minutes and it, and I, I love it. Uh, that's before Dana gets it. Um, and then, <laughs> and then we see if Dana loves it. And then it. we see if Dana loves it. So, so, there, but I think there, there's two factors here. We've talked about how to write. We've talked about the mechanics of writing and that is one aspect of it. But the other thing is just having something to say, mm. because I think this is a big problem in modern writing. Absolutely. And because having something to say requires that you have experience in life. And if you go back and you look at a lot of the great writers, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of Jack London and uh, Louis L'Amour and these, these really good writers, they had life experiences. Uh, I mean, amazing life experiences. And so when they went to write something, they had all of these experiences to draw on. And I've, I've said this before. I don't remember if I've said it on this show, but this is why I think fantasy is so popular right now because it's an artificial setting. And a lot of them, are, in a lot of these books, setting is very weak. It's not convincing. It's not a real world of the kind that Tolkien is able to create in Lord of the Rings. That's a real world to me. Um, but it's, it, they don't do, the, a lot of modern writers don't do setting well. They, they do fantasy because it doesn't require you to have a real setting. And so they're very airy. They're very unconvincing. And, um, and it's because we have a whole generation of writers who have not led a real life. They haven't done anything exciting in their lives. They haven't, you know, they haven't explored, they haven't um, sailed, they haven't hiked, they haven't, I mean, th those are the things that, that get you the experience that you have something to write about rather than just being very derivative and all your experiences are coming from something you read. I'd be curious, um, and I'm thinking through uh, the authors that come to mind, but um, the idea of a professional writer that you can graduate from college and become a writer like from the get go is a fairly modern thing. Right. I mean, uh, I was just listening to a podcast and they were talking about where Charles Dickens used to sit in the front, uh, in, in the front window of a store, like filling canisters with, with shoe polish. Right. Like when you, when you think about that and you go, Oh, that explains so much about the people he wrote about. Because he had that experience. And he was in debtor's prison with his family. You know, when his dad got thrown into debtor's prison, he knew what he was. He mm -hmm. did have the experience. But on the other hand, for young students, they really don't have any life experience. So we have to give them things to write about that are within the context of what they've read. Mm -hmm. Sure. But so that's, 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 sure. A, that's, that's a way. Right, we're that's a secondary them. way we're to do them that. Something yeah, to absolutely. Write about. Because right. they're, they've, they've got a model. It, I mean, reading a book and particularly some of the books we have in our curriculum is kind of giving you an experience. It's, it's an account anyway right. of, uh, of certain things. Um, but this idea that, that, all we need to do is know how to write, but really don't have all that much to say is I think a problem in a lot of modern. Uh, yeah. I remember sitting in classes, even seventh, eighth grade high school and, and the teacher would come in and say, okay, I want, you know, one or two pages on, you know, what you did this summer. And I'm like, I don't, what? that is such a total oh, waste no, no, yeah, right, right. Like, but Never it, it, the, do the, that. The hardest, never the, do what that. I was struggling with was what do I even say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, how do I say this? You know, it was, I don't even know what to say. Yeah, I, that resonates. Another theory to kind of explain the phenomenon you're talking about, Martin, is perhaps, you know, the can one of the five candidates of rhetoric is memory. And I think in the modern world, we offload a lot of our memory in ways that are really advantageous to us, the amount of data that we can access, but it causes us in a modern situation to not have to memorize as many things. And then what are you drawing on in your, in your writing? So I think a lot of the professional writers of our day, the sports writers, news columnists, they're not people who have a lot of rich things memorized. And so their writing comes across as, you know, weak and right. turgid. I mean, I mean, but you go to some of the older sports writers, there's a red barber, I think was his name. Uh, some of these, some of the, there was, has been some fabulous sports writing, but it's because they had all these other experiences other than sports and all the, all the analogies, um, of Vince Scully, who was the, 
announcer for the L.A. Dodgers. I grew up in Southern California, and I just remember that transistor radio out by the pool in the summer, listening to a Dodgers game on a lazy afternoon, and and Vince Scully's voice coming. And he had these metaphors that he clearly grew up in the country, and so uh, you know the 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 batter would go out there and he hit hit the ground around the base with the with the with the bat before he got up. He says. Shaking up a pack of worms, you know, so <laughs> sit in the catbird seat. That was one of his his expressions. These are all these all come from all these past experiences. Not only that, but uh, I'm because I was mostly talking about setting when I was talking about this before, but also characterization. Mm-hmm. I'm I've been listening to Framley Parsonage by uh, Anthony Trollope. All those characters, you you couldn't invent them. You you would have to have known people well, same like thing that. With Dickens, that this, I was going to say, I yes. was going to use Dickens as another example. You know that that he he's he got knew somebody people. in mind. <laughs> yeah, he had somebody in mind when he was talking about <laughs> Mrs. Jellybee, or in in Bleak House, or or some of these other characters. Mm-hmm. There, you could not have made those up out of thin they're, air. You had to have real. known somebody yes. like that. So you had to have, have been engaged in society in some way. Uh, another kind of experience that that you need to draw upon because characterization, their setting. And there's characterization, and then there's plot. Mm-hmm. Really, that's you know, in a sense, the last thing mm-hmm. in writing in a fiction. Tony, I have a question for you. I think that in teaching students to write more than maybe any other subject, teachers get in their own way by getting frustrated with the process. And a phenomenon that I've experienced—I don't know if you all have—is that in talking to parents of HLS students, they all, without one exception that I've experienced, has said just shocked by how well their students write compared to them at that age. But then in talking to school leaders and teachers around the country, they have so little trust in the writing curriculum and they, they wonder why isn't this being taught in this way and why are, you know, and there seems to be a discrepancy between the trust of the educators in the process and the actual results that's being achieved by those who lean into the process. Why do you think there's so much hesitancy to embrace the classical composition or the classical approach to writing in general. I think it's just scary to people because it take because it's totally different from what all their kids' friends are doing. What it's totally it doesn't feel like a writing program. Mm. It feels I mean it really is a rhetoric program, right. but it's doing so much more mm. than your three paragraph, five paragraph, three point essay because it's taking your students so much deeper. But it's doing it in a way that really classical composition is writing exercises. So the paragraphs aren't necessarily going to flow. They're not going to transition well from one to the other because that's not the point of it. But then when the students do have to write a paper on something, you know, in the Iliad, then they can they know how to do it. This this goes back to, to Paul's point. You mentioned, you know, you 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 have a team practice and you just go out and scrimmage. This I, I if if I see a team and a coach out there and all they're doing is scrimmaging, I know I don't have a good coach. I there's certain in my my, my son went to college on a soccer scholarship. He's a very good player, and and what they did was mostly not scrimmage, and particularly at first, early in the season, and then later on they do it. So this five paragraph essay thing is like scrimmaging. It's like we're gonna mm-hmm. we're gonna do a five paragraph. Okay, we're scrimmage. We're scrimmaging here. We're not. We're not putting together the the fundamental elements and the mental uh, exercises because a lot of those are really mental exercises they are. that you're going to be able to use to do this much better later. Right. That's right. And, but it's scary to people because yes. it's like my my child can't write a five paragraph paper. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But what are we asking them to do so much that it's something that is so much more than that? I would like to make two points uh, alongside what in Tanya's response to your answer. One is I'm, I, I'm not sure th- at these educators you're talking about that don't have tr- trust in the process. I don't know that they fully understand this. This is not something we came up with out of thin air, mm. right? This is something that's been practiced for a couple thousand years, right? And over the past a hundred or two, we lost, Right. So there's a long pedigree, so that should give them some trust. But I think the other thing, too, is what Cheryl Lowe used to always say, that people overestimate what they can get done in a year and underestimate what they can do in five, right? right. So it's, it's you know, the, the as a teacher, we, we want to see our students walking out with something tangible, right? 
And it's hard to look and say, okay, this year, all I'm going to do is get them these two steps forward. Whereas I could ask them to write a five paragraph paper and I feel like they've taken 10 steps forward. And so it's, it's some, you know, we just have to be content with that one year progress, trusting that the educators coming after me are going to, are going to continue that process. And that's, that's what a, what a consistent curriculum over eight years will give you. And it does take, it's not easy to teach because it is so different and something that teachers aren't familiar with. Mm -hmm. So it is going to take the teacher's time. You know, you have to watch the videos, read the teacher manual and really figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so it does, you know, it is time consuming for the teacher to learn how to teach it well. Right. And you don't know that's, I mean, to Paul's point, the teacher teaching Crea Maxim has no idea necessarily what refutation confirmation is, and they're not really connected. They're all teaching different skills. And so, you know, a teacher in one grade doesn't necessarily know that's the advantage of the homeschooler is that they're going to go with their students stage by stage by stage. But in a school, you're, you're stuck in your grade. You're right. in that isolated classroom with your students. And it's just like we would say. You should know more Latin than you're teaching. If you're teaching first form, you should have done second form. It's the same thing. If you're if you're teaching fable, you should understand narrative. If you're teaching narrative, you should know what's coming with Cray Maxim, but it's hard to find the time for that. Yeah. So for our last question, I think for uh, advice for teachers teaching students how to write, they should just use classical composition. So I won't even ask you guys that question. <laughs> Instead, for adult listeners of the program who maybe want to think about writing or want to grow in the writing, would any of you have any recommendations about maybe books on writing or things that they are authors that you would suggest that they emulate? Um, I mentioned William Zinsser's On Writing Well. It's a fantastic book. And I, I enjoyed thinking about the, the process of writing and reading it. Um, any of you have any recommendations? Well, I would I would think if you're an older person, you, you 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 know you've seen a lot of writing. You kind of know probably some of the mechanics are implicit. Um, I I think uh, I think just if, you know if you're a reader, you, you you should just start by just summarizing what you read and your reaction. Just keep a journal of the books you read. I think that that's an excellent. I think, you know, we're, we're putting out a, a book of Tracy Lee Simmons essays and they're almost all essays on books. And because what that does is it, it, it gives you a little space to work in that's clearly defined. You're writing about this book and you're responding to it. Um, it's a small frame. You know, don't, don't try a big, don't try the big stuff at first. Start small. Uh, write about books. Write essays on books. There's, there's places you can get these published, particularly online now, uh, that are reviews of books. I think that's a great place to start. I think that there are people, adults, teachers, um, hopefully, I mean, homeschoolers who are very hesitant to edit their children's work because they don't feel capable of it and maybe aren't capable of mm -hmm. it. So in that case, writing is really important. Mm -hmm. I would say get help. Get a tutor. Take the writing classes that are on Memoria Academy so that somebody else is helping you grade your students' work. Because if not, you're not, you're not going to make any progress if the student doesn't understand what needs to happen to improve his or her writing. Absolutely. And and I mean, not everybody is a writer or right. even knows the mechanics right. to be able to help their students. And that's okay. Right. I couldn't help my student with physics. It, but if you are an adult who uh, is homeschooling or a teacher that is going to be using the classical composition program and just wants the experience of what a student would go through, get a couple of papers graded. We do have this summer, we're doing adult classes for fable and narrative and cray maxim. Oh, that's nice. And the online Academy. Um, and so I, I can't remember if it's a five or an eight week course, but it's great um, help. Abigail Johnson going through that. And um, is it one class for all three stages? No, it's one class you for Fable and Narrative, class. I think. We're doing Fable and Narrative together, and then one class that's Crayon Maxim. Yeah, that, that would be and, really helpful and, to anybody. And so if if you have your mechanics down and you have, you know, you, you feel somewhat confident in writing, 
and and helping your child, but you're you're unfamiliar with the program, it's it's perfect because then you will get a feel for what's what the program's going for as you practice that a couple of times and be more confident as a teacher. Yeah, that's right. That's great. Can I ask one more question? Another recommendation I'd have. You're, you're the moderator. You can ask any question you want. Thanks, Martin. Own it, Shane. One recommendation I would have for anybody is a book that I've read for a while. I was reading it every year. It's Elements of Style by Strunk and White, mm-hmm. the same White uh, who wrote you know, Charlotte's Web. Um, because it's just a refresher on the mechanics. But I've heard some persuasive counter arguments that maybe you should outgrow Elements of Style eventually. <laughs> um what are your guys' thoughts on opposite style? I have heard, and, and it's really been more in recent years that I've heard this pushback on Strunk and White because their focus was stra- being straightforward and simple. Omit needless words. Uh, omit needless words. And so I, I really do, I think that's really good advice, particularly at the beginning of your writing, is just get rid of needless stuff. I mean, part of, I think, what Wendell's doing in, in his writing that you have to correct all the time is, is he's getting rid of needless words because you read Wendell Berry and every word is the right word in the right place. I mean, he's really a, a literary artist uh, that uh, of a kind that I, I really don't know who else does that as well as he does. But um, so I, I do think that that is sound advice. I, and I, you know, quite frankly, a lot of the people who don't like Stark and white, um, I, I don't trust them. I, I they, they they want to be f- no I, they they want to be Thank flowery. Like they they want to you know just say what you want to say, and it doesn't mean you you can't be creative about it. I mean, it, uh, but really good writing is mostly simple, and and most bad writing is too complex. So why is Strunk and White not good advice? Yeah, I don't yeah. <laughs> and and I think they've got a they've got an affinity for the Anglo Saxon, right? Versus the Latinate, the yes. smaller, yes, which, shorter which words, is, which is good. That's why you get that brevity and that clarity. Yes, I, I think I think Paul, what Paul's saying is absolutely right. You know, uh, Wendell, when I heard him teaching writing um, for several weeks at Highlands, um, he would he would take the the students papers <laughs> and he would, he would, he would have graded them and make, and he would cover him class and they'd say, Joe, in your paper and in front of everybody. And he would say, <laughs> and what he would do, he's, he would say, he let me read to you what you said. And he would read the sentence and then he would say, why didn't you just say, you know? And so like, and I, I don't know if this, if he actually said this, but this is the first example that comes to my mind is, you know, you said altercation. Why didn't you just say fight? It's it, what Paul said is, is I think really important. Latin is complex. And so the more Latinate something is, the more complex and clunky the writing is. So altercation, that's, that's a several syllable Latinate word. Fight is a very simple one syllable Anglo-Saxon word. So, so this is why the, this is why the King James Bible is a better translation than I think, than say the Dewey Reams, which is a, an older Catholic translation is because the Dewey Reams is very Latinate. I think it was, was it translated from well, the Latin? No, it, well, it was, it was actually the King James, the Dewey Reams, fascinatingly enough, the King James was translated. The Dewey Reams used the King James as a guide, but then sort of Latinated it and made <laughs> yeah. sure that there was, that there was that anything that was worrisome about Catholic doctrine was clarified in there. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the King James Bible is much more Anglo-Saxon, which is why the writing is better. Yeah. I like altercation better than <laughs> well, but I think there's, I think, you know, but again, speaking to younger writers, right. That is good advice. But because, then as you, yes. as you grow, mm-hmm. there are times where altercation is a good word. Well, to yes. Use. But you have to use it in the right place. And That's it, right. But, but, but normally speaking, you use the simpler thing, the more straightforward That's right. thing. And, and discernment is not something kids are great mm-hmm. at. Yes. About when to use what. And so now they don't know the difference between Anglo Saxon and Latin. So you <laughs> Well and they're trying our students do. Uh, yeah, right. They're right. trying to um to impress in in their writing rather than just saying what mm-hmm. they think. They're trying to make it sound I mean, they're trying to get an A. <laughs> well and this was apparently uh and I can't remember H. A. H. A. Shippey, uh his book on Tolkien, and he makes this point that that Tolkien did not like the Latinate. He didn't like the French. He didn't like that. Big Norse guy. Yeah. He, he, well, yeah, it was Anglo-Saxon. 
uh, it's not bag cul-de-sac, it's bag end, uh, 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 an Anglo-Saxon word. He identified himself um, not as a Tolkien, he'd say I'm a Sheffield, which is an Anglo-Saxon hmm. uh, background. So uh, he, he he's a good writer, I think, partly because he does this. It reminds me of my grandfather who got apparently one problem wrong on his you know college level writing, English class because when the teacher asked, you know, what are the marks of good writing? He said, avoiding susquipedalianisms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, sound advice, I'm sure. I don't know what it, is, what it means, but... It's a t- too long word. You used, you used one to, to prove the point. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation about writing. I hope you guys have too. Thank you for listening to this episode of Classical Etc. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider liking this video. If you want to join the conversation, then you can comment below. And if you want to stay connected, please subscribe to our channel. I hope you enjoyed this show and we'll see you next time.